Now, let's get into the fun stuff. So we're going to start talking about aircraft. We'll, we'll talk today is primarily about just the basics of what an airframe is, what an airframe does, how do we understand loads in the airframe, how do we um, just get a high, very high level picture of what our structures that are flying around um, that still still to this day, despite the fact I've been teaching this course for nearly a decade now, um, it still amazes me that we can get sort of 400 ton objects off the ground and fly them around. Um, and I hope it amazes you. So this is, gives you the first insight into, into how that works. So the first thing um, that we need to understand are things about loads on the aircraft. Okay, so this is not doing what I want it to. All right, so this lecture is fairly interactive. I need you to get a pen and paper or some kind of drawing tablet out. Um, I want you to draw a free body diagram for a fixed wing aircraft in straight and level flight, in a turn, in a sort of level bank turn, and on the ground. Now, I'm not going to give you any more specifics than that. You can make whatever assumptions you like. Um, but have a crack at drawing what you think I'm expecting here. Straight and level flight is something that you'll hear a lot for the next couple of years. Uh, straight and level flight is the, the kind of go-to condition that we stick an aircraft in when we're trying to think about it and what it's doing um, in terms of performance and in terms of structures. Uh, because from straight and level flight, we can then impose other conditions on it as we see fit. But this is the sort of default state that a cruising aircraft lives in. Now, this is obviously a very rough FBD. Um, I've really treated the aircraft as a particle here. But we have a lift force, which you all should be familiar with. Uh, we'll talk a bit more about how we generate lift, uh, primarily not in this course, in the aerodynamics course. But we'll talk about um, the interaction between lift and weight a lot in this course. Thrust and drag are equal and opposite in straight and level flight as a lift and weight. Now, thrust is not at all real covered in this course. That's, that's the, what you'd learn in the um, flight mechanics and propulsion course. And drag, we don't talk about much either. In general, um, thrust and drag are significantly smaller than lift and weight. So in terms of the aircraft and the structures that we need, um, lift and weight have a much bigger impact on the structural design than thrust and drag do. Uh, in terms of the, the amount of material we need to carry those loads. And in straight and level flight, there's nothing really interesting happening out of the plane here. So there's nothing happening on, in and out of the page that's of interest. Now, this, from a structure's perspective, how useful is it? Um, this is not really telling us anything about the loads in the airframe, is it? It's telling us a lot about what's happening as a whole to the airframe and to the aircraft. But there's nothing that's going to, about this kind of diagram that's going to tell us how much load is in the wing or how much load is in the tail. Um, we're, we're relying on this. This can tell us how this kind of particle aircraft moves around, but it's not going to tell us anything about um, the structures. So I've, I've got a, some pictures of of the other conditions in a minute, but I, won't, I'll, I want to take a bit of a side note um, and talk about these, the nature of some of these loads. So if we look at these loads here, um, weight loads, when we talk about weight, weight is always acting towards the ground and precisely towards the center of the Earth. Um, and it's obviously proportional to the mass of the aircraft. And if we're flying around near the surface of the Earth, uh, which most of the cases we consider are, then it's a very simple relationship to work out what the force due to gravity is or the weight and of, a, of a point mass or of some kind of distributed mass like fuel. We just take its density, multiply it by the volume, and then gravitational constant, and we have a, a force. 
Now, there's another type of load um, which we use a lot in this course for in accelerating systems, and it's what we call an inertia load or an inertial load. Um, and it's a pseudo force. It's not really a force, and, and you'll get into arguments with um, first year physics students about this that think they know a lot about how forces work. Um, that we can we can cast our system into um, into a non-inertial frame. And it's using what's called D'Alembert's principle, and there's a nice link there you can have a look. But se Newton's second law, traditionally we take sum of forces on the left, and we say that's equal to the mass times acceleration on the right. We don't really like dynamic systems very much if we can avoid it. We like to do static equilibrium systems. And so what we can do is take the MA and stick it on the left-hand side of the equation and just cheat and pretend it's in equilibrium. Um, and so when we have an accelerating system like this ball on a string that's spinning around in a circle, the traditional kind of second year mechanics way to look at that is sum of forces equals MA. We work out what the acceleration is, V squared on R, so we can work out the tension in the cable by equating T equals V squared on R. That's the, the traditional way of doing things. Um, the way that we like to do it in this course, which gives pays big dividend when you're talking about very complex systems, is to treat the acceleration as an as inertia of acting in the opposite direction. So you take any accelerations, you multiply them by the mass, so what we've done here, and the minus sign just points them in the opposite direction, and we can say we've now got this equilibrium equation to solve. If the tension on that side, minus ma equals zero, t minus mv squared on r equals zero. It's the same equation in this simple case, very easy to see the equivalence between those two things, but it's very helpful with, with complex systems. Now, the reason I talk about arguments with first year physics students is this is often called the centrifugal force. And, and if you talk to people who've just started learning some, some dynamics, they'll say, there's no such thing as a centrifugal force. Ah, oh, bullshit. There is a centrifugal force. We can feel it. It's real. Um, and it's just about how what reference frame we're looking in. Um, so this uh, way of thinking about inertia loads is very useful when we start talking about um, modes of motion for the aircraft where we're accelerating. And those accelerating motions are the ones that are going to cause the aircraft to break up into pieces. Um, and when acceleration's involved, we don't think about traditional weight. So we, reserve, we, we leave weight as it is. Weight always points towards the center of the, the Earth. When acceleration's involved, we, we think of something called an apparent weight. And everyone knows apparent weight, even if they don't know the terminology for it. Anyone who's been in an accelerating car or a roller coaster or a light aircraft has felt apparent weight. Um, and it's equal and opposite to, uh, so if we've got an acceleration, let's take this weight that's sitting there in space and we accelerate it to the right. Then we add our inertia load in, which is equivalent to our acceleration. Now the sum of these two things in, in, in a vector way is we call the apparent weight. Okay? And if we just give it a, a, a constant n, which is some multiple times, the magnitude of it is some multiple times the real weight. And this n is the g-loading. So if you've ever heard of someone talk about a, like the, the Formula One car was pulling four Gs in a turn, this is what they're talking about. Okay. Or if you talk about fighter pilots pulling a certain number of Gs, that's, that's, that N is the, it's the load factor, we call it. And for most maneuvers, lift is opposite this apparent weight. And we'll see that in a diagram with a turn in a second. Um, and it's equal to that. Okay? Because lift is, the, is providing the acceleration which is causing this load factor. And the easiest way, if anyone 
hasn't been on a roller coaster, I apologise, but I assume that most people haven't got to this point in their lives without being on a roller coaster at least once. Um, if you think about what you're feeling as you go on a roller coaster, if you go over the top of a crest with any kind of velocity, you feel like you're leaving your seat a little bit. And uh, if you go over fast enough, you can actually leave your seat. Um, as you're free falling, or very close to free falling, you're not feeling much weight at all. As you go through the bottom of a, of a um, sorry, I'm taking my lapel mic. Um, as you go through the bottom of a trough in the roller coaster, you're feeling very heavy. You're feeling more weight than usual. Um, and so, at all times, gravity is the same. Okay, we've got the same gravitational component, but what we have is different accelerations. So at the top, you've got a little vertical acceleration. Down here, you've got a fair vertical acceleration. Upwards, you've got a, a downwards acceleration. Oh, sorry. This is the apparent component, so this is the opposite of what's really happening. So you're actually accelerating downwards here, but the inertia load is acting up. Here, you're accelerating upwards, but your inertia load is acting down. And if you sum all those up, then you get what you're actually feeling. So in free fall, you've got an inertia load and uh, because you're accelerating down at about the same rate as gravity, those two things balance out and you feel nothing. As you're at the bottom, the two things sum up and you feel heavier. As you come over a crest at speed, you feel a lot lighter. And so that's the way that we think about um, apparent weight in the aircraft. And th having this kind of picture in mind when we start doing um, calculations with load factor is very very helpful. Now this is the next one of those free body diagrams that I wanted to have a look at. Now I'm missing some forces here obviously. Obviously there's some drag on this aircraft and obviously there's some thrust being generated. Um, and the poor old A380 that's now been, being, uh, uh, the production line's being canned. Um, unfortunately features in a few of my diagrams. Um, the, the A380 was making its first mate, like maiden flights and all of its initial design and maiden flights was during my undergraduate time. And so it's got a sort of special place in my heart as poor as it's been as a commercial aircraft. Um, it, it was the, the aircraft that everyone was using for examples when, when I went through. Um, so if I need to talk about modern examples, I can pull up modern examples, but if I'm looking at loads on an aircraft, then I'm going to use an A380. Um, the inertia loads here, we haven't drawn yet, but we have our sort of traditional loads. We have lift, which is always drawn in aircraft coordinates. Okay, so this aircraft is, is banked. The weight's drawn in global world coordinates, but the lift is drawn in aircraft coordinates. So as the aircraft moves around, the lift is always acting in the same coordinates as the aircraft. And if this aircraft is in a level turn, it means it's not accelerating upwards or downwards, which means we have some kind of equilibrium system here we need to, to look into. There's an acceleration, and I've put an M here, I probably should take that M out. There's an acceleration towards the center of the bank. Um, which I can then turn into a um, inertia force acting in the opposite direction. And now we have a system that we can apply our traditional equilibrium rules to. Okay. Now, you can choose whatever coordinate system you like. You can choose global coordinates and say, the, the, the vertical component of the lift has to equal the weight and the horizontal component of lift has to equal um, the inertia. Or you can, you can look in aircraft coordinates as well. But either way, what we find is the apparent weight opposes the lift and is equal and opposite to it. So that when we do our vector sum here, it's equal and opposite to the, to the lift. Now, why are these kind of conditions important? Well, a turn, when this, load, this apparent weight, this load factor here, n, is bigger than 1, 
then our aircraft, all of the, the aircraft structure that's generating that lift is experiencing loads that are scaled by this load factor. So if you're generating more lift, so remember here, lift is equal to n times weight. If you're generating more lift, you're generating larger stresses, you're generating more loads on your airframe that you need to account for. So this n is really like a scaling factor for how much stress we're putting our aircraft under. Now, everything I've set up to this point is very simplified, obviously. Um, most loads aren't constant. Um, they're, they're varying depending on airspeed, uh, acceleration, maneuvers, control surface deflections, all sorts of things. So we won't talk about most of these variations in this course. A lot of them are for other performance-related courses that you'll come across. But just be aware that when you're starting to do any kind of design calculation or you're trying to reverse engineer a structure, you're not reverse engineering it for the straight and level flight case. You're, you're trying to find critical, um, critical cases with which to um, do your calculations. And those critical cases, there's a, there's a near infinite number of um, conditions that we could get the aircraft in while it's flying. And there are a lot of rules in the regulations about identifying what we call critical load cases. So those critical load cases are ones that are likely to um, induce failure, or th those kinds of conditions that the aircraft may experience um, that are likely to induce failure. And the simplest uh, way we can handle these critical load cases is with what we call a flight envelope. Now, I won't go into too much detail in this course about a flight envelope other than knowing that it's there. Um, that's Sonia's job in, in design next semester. But just to give you a very brief overview of how it works, the vertical axis here, N is our load factor that we've talked about. So this is when you're feeling really heavy, and this is where you're feeling really light. Or actually, when you're zero, you're feeling nothing. If you're feeling negative N, it means you're actually feeling like you want to go the opposite direction, like when you're going across the top of a crest. Um, and V, I should probably have V here, e here is your equivalent airspeed. Now, equivalent airspeed is not your actual airspeed. It's scaled by air, air density and other things that you'll learn about. But really, this is saying this is how fast the aircraft's going, and this is um, how heavy you feel or how much load is on the structure. What we say is that the aircraft has to live inside this envelope. Uh, otherwise, this is, this is what we call a design envelope because it, these are the conditions that we design the aircraft for. And as long as the aircraft lives its life inside here, we're OK. If the aircraft goes outside of these boxes, we've got a problem. Now, the, the notation on here uh, is the notation taken from the FAR regulations. Now, you're in an interesting time because the FAR have just changed about a year ago, massively changed how their regulations work. They used to have all of these diagrams and calculations and they said, this is exactly how you design an aircraft. Now all of the, all of the detail has been taken out and thrown into um, ASTM standards that say this is a good way to design an aircraft. But this, the regulations now just say, very simple statements like it must be able to withstand the aerodynamic loads and it must be able to withstand these things. So the regulations now are very simplified, but it means you've got to go and dig for the detail of how you would do it um, if you wanted to do a generic aircraft design. Let's go along this axis. If the, there are a few labels on this axis which I won't talk about because they're not relevant to this course. There's a VA and a VB and a VA star and other things along here. VC is our critical or our cruise velocity. Okay, So our cruise velocity is where the aircraft is spending its time in straight and level flight generally. And straight and level flight is, if I can bring up my pen, 
straight level flight lives there where we have a load factor of 1. Okay, because if you've got a load factor of 1, it means your lift equals your weight. You're feeling traditional 1G loads on you. So that point is a fair way from most of the edges of the box. It's not so far away from, from the, um, this side, but unfortunately, in order to make our aircraft get to, from point A to point B in an efficient amount of time, we have to fly fairly fast relative to the critical um, speed of the aircraft. Now, VD is often called the design dive speed. Luckily, a lot of the critical terms also have D in them. It's also the divergence speed. It's the speed at which you're likely to break the aircraft from flying it too fast. So at, there's a certain speed we'll find out about right at the end of the course where if you exceed that speed, your wings will twist off and you won't have an aircraft anymore. You'll have a flying cigar temporarily and then a falling cigar. Um, I think you mean a flying coffin. Yeah, coffin, yes. Um, so this speed is something that a pilot can break our aircraft by exceeding. Engineers are never at fault here if we do our job. It's always the pilots that are going to break things. Um, a pilot can fly the aircraft too far fast and break it. And also, if we go vertically here, if we go too high, which means we've pulled a maneuver that's too many Gs, so if we've, we've done something that's um, made the aircraft too heavy or made us too heavy, that, that is generally things like banking in a turn that's too tight or um, pulling out of a dive too quickly. You can generate positive maneuvers that have got too high a load factor. And this number's generally about three. It's three plus or minus something. For acrobatic aircraft, it can go up to um, eight or nine, and for military, like for, for very high performance military aircraft, it can be much higher than that. Um, but this is where, if you go above that, you'll you'll snap the wings off your aircraft through just making it too heavy. This is where you'll snap the wings off your aircraft by flying too fast, and this is where you'll snap the wings off the aircraft by doing the opposite of making it too heavy. So if you just push down on the stick and and um, sort of go over a crest too fast, then you, you're doing the opposite thing to what you normally do, and uh, you'll break it in the other direction. The only interesting part of this that's not to do with pilots breaking the aircraft, this is just to do with physics. Again, the engineer's not at fault. Um, we have here, this is where we call what we call stall lines. So if you fly faster, sorry, if you fly slower than this point, this point here, if you fly slower than, than there, this velocity, at straight and level sort of g equals 1 conditions, you will, the wings will stall. They just won't have enough speed over them to generate lift, and they'll stall, and your aircraft will start falling out of the sky. Um, and the same in the negative condition as well. You're going to have negative stall from going the other way. Um, because to fly slower, You've got to increase the angle of attack. You've got to generate more lift. And eventually, there's just no more lift to be able to, there's no more ability for the wing to be able to do that. All right, that's enough talking about uh, um, what we call a VN diagram or a flight envelope. Let's talk about distribution now. So everything we've talked to at this point is primarily treating the aircraft like a particle, like a point. Now we want to think about how the loads are actually distributed. Now this, I've, I haven't actually noted where I've stolen this diagram from, but this is not my diagram. Um, this is a good sort of first approximation for a, a better free body diagram that gives us some indication of what the stresses in the aircraft are going to be, or what the loads are going to be, or the moments. And this is taking loads and actually distributing them to where they're being generated. So we have some kind of lift distribution, and most of the lift is being generated by the wings. There are bits of lift generated elsewhere, but they're secondary. So that's, that's a distributed um, load. And 
to a reasonable approximation, the lift is generated in a shape like this. There's not much lift being generated out near the wingtips due to the complex aerodynamics that's happening out here. There's a lot being generated in the middle, maybe a bit of a dip around where the fuselage is, and then there's not much generated at the wingtip again. And that's balancing point loads. So we have um, structures and payload, engines, fuel, and point loads, or distributed loads, but they're weights. So all of these bits at the bottom we would call our weight, and the bit at the top we would call our lift. Now, that's now starting to look like something that you should be able to analyze. Okay, if you're thinking, if you just squint a little bit and look at it out of the side of your eye, then this looks like a beam. We have a distributed load on a beam, and we have some point loads coming off that beam. We're starting to get something that we can um, analyze for loads and shear forces, bending moments, and things like that. Okay, and this is, in fact, the, the vast majority of how we're going to approach things in this course is to treat the aircraft like a bunch of beams. There's a, a few aerodynamic things that I have to introduce now as much as it pains me. I, I can't stand aerodynamics and I've never been good at it. Um, I think those two things might be correlated. Um, but we need to talk a little bit about aerodynamics in order to understand how we're applying forces. For a particular airfoil, and you'll learn a lot more about this, and so if I tell you something wrong here, just ignore me because I'm probably wrong. Um, for a particular airfoil in a condition, in a particular flight condition, there's a point at which all of this distributed lift and drag, I'm slicing through the airfoil here, um, acts. So we can take all of these forces and take a particular point and say we call this our center of pressure. And we, take, and we say lift is the component of force that's acting um, vertically in the aircraft components, the coordinates, and drag is the bit that's horizontal. Now, the magnitudes here are all out of whack because if we've got a drag that's this big compared to our lift, we're not going anywhere today. Um, generally, the drag's a lot smaller than the lift. Um, <clears throat> now, that's useful, but not so useful for structures people because as you change the angle of attack, this point moves around. As you change the angle of attack, your lift distribution is changing a bit and that point is moving. So that point becomes not so useful for us because it's very easy for a slight change in conditions of the aircraft to move our reference point. So what we tend to use is a thing called the aerodynamic center, which is drawn over here. And the aerodynamic center is not at the center of pressure. The aerodynamic center is a point about which the moments, so remember, because we've moved our, our reference point, we also need a moment now. It's the point about which our moments don't change with angle of attack. Just, there exists a point. We could pick any point. We could pick a point here. We could pick a point there. There exists a point at, at which, if we resolve our forces and moments at that point, those moments don't change with angle of attack so that we can... We can um, simplify the moment calculation and take it out of the expression um, and then just worry about how our lift and drag um, varies. So we tend to do most of our calculations at a point which we call the aerodynamic center. And the aerodynamic center for, for a, a, to a reasonable first approximation for most airfoils is about a quarter of the way from front to the back of the airfoil, which we call the cord. Okay, it's, it's, a, quarter of, it's a quarter of the cord from the, the leading edge to the aerodynamic center. For the vast majority of airfoils that we use, except delta wings and all sorts of strange aerodynamic surfaces, for, for traditional airfoils, that's a pretty good approximation. Now, when we start doing our, treating our aircraft like 
beams and, and trying to do calculations based on those beams. We need to have an understanding of how lift is distributed. And I don't know why my line drawing of my A380 doesn't have wing fences. That's a bit of a bit of an annoyance. But um, the lift distribution, for, for want of a better approximation, looks a bit like this. We can approximate that with a number of different methods. There are, there are semi-analytical methods called lifting line theory, and there are other aerodynamic tricks to work out what it's doing. There's a really um, rough one called Schrenk's distribution, which you can look up. Um, I think I have some notes for it in the notebook. But it's, a, it's an approximation where you, you, you sum up an ellipse. So if you draw an ellipse on here, you, draw, you sum up an ellipse. Now, I'm not good at drawing ellipses. I've just shown myself. But, um, and then you sum up a, another shape that's the shape of the airfoil plan form, which in this case probably looks something like this. If you sum those two things up, you end up with, a, with something that pretty closely approximates the lift distribution. Okay? Now, I'll leave that for you to have a look at um, on your own time. It's not so critical for the calculations that we do. Okay, so loads in the airframe. So we've talked a lot about loads on the airframe. Now we're going to talk about loads in the airframe. But I want to ask a fairly strange question. Um, why do we need an airframe? What is an airframe actually doing for us? Yeah, but so we, we need a structure. So obviously if we're flying along at a few hundred kilometers an hour with um, airflow hitting us in the face, it wouldn't be particularly pleasant. So the first job obviously is environmental protection. It's, it's giving us something to be inside. But what if we had to think abstractly about what the structure of the airframe is doing, what's its primary structural role? Why do we have all the bits of the aircraft the way we currently have bits of the aircraft? Yeah, so it's withstanding load, but where is the where is the load coming from? We're generating lift in one part of the airframe, and we have weight in another part of the airframe. Air yeah, so we've got air pressure on the, the on the fuselage and on the wings, which is generating our lifts, and when the, the airframe moves those loads to where the weight is, that's really what the airframe is doing. Okay, so it's. We, we can't generate lift where the weight is um, unless we've got some crazy flying wing configuration. Um, with our current airframe configurations, the lift is generated in a place, I'm going to flap my arms a lot in this course, it's generated in a place that's not where the, the core mass of the airframe is. So the payload and all the things that we want to get up there are in the fuselage, and all the bits that are doing the job for us are out in the wings, and the airframe is translating the loads generated in the wings to the payload. And so its primary structural role is to literally move that load from one place to another. Um, and so we, we work out all of the loads that are required, and the, the, the amount of material that's required and the type of material that's required, and its, and its layout in order to do that job. And that's the, the primary job of the airframe. Okay, So to move all the external loads, thrust, lift, to the passengers and payload. Okay? We don't want a jet engine strapped to our, us when we're flying along unless we're this crazy guy. Um, and if you haven't seen those Red Bull videos, that's well worth a watch. Um, but the, you've got all of these loads being generated on the aircraft. We're the thing when we sit in a seat. We're the thing that we're paying the money. We're the payload. We need to be moved from one place to another safely. So the airframe is transporting the loads from where they're being generated to where they're being used, which is to keep all of the things inside aloft. Um, now, there are a lot of secondary roles. It's very simplistic to say it only carries load. Obviously, environmental control, keeping pressures, temperatures, um, everything reasonable for human um, existence, crash protection. So there's a lot of structure underneath the floor in an aircraft that's designed to, to dissipate energy if it crashes. 
uh, and there are other, other roles as well. But the, the biggest one that concerns us in this course is, is this structural role. Sorry, my little cursor is not going the right way. Um, now, again, let's do some free body diagrams. But this time, we'll start with a free body diagram and we'll look at shear forces and bending moments. I'm, I'm not going to worry about sign convention, but if I have a shear force diagram, it's going to look something like this. Oh, my pen doesn't flip out on me. Okay, where the step, the point loads are going to create steps in the um, shear force diagram, and if I choose a different color for my bending moment diagram, that the bending moments are going to increase linearly, and then they're going to increase at a different slope, and they'll be zero out here. Now my shear force diagram for the, this case is going to start at zero and increase and come down. Okay, whether it comes down or not is kind of immaterial um, because there's always a, a bit of structure that's experiencing the full load there. And just to be consistent with my sign convention, I'll draw my moment diagram the other way around. So the moment diagram is doing something like this. Okay, where it's, it's parabolic. If I've got a linear increase in shear force, I've got a parabolic increase in bending moment. Now, any concerns yet? So now, for this last case, I'd need to think a little bit about the magnitudes of the distances and the forces involved, but I can do a pretty good um, first pass guess of what this is going to look like. I can decrease linearly, increase where my reaction force is, decrease linearly, increase where my reaction force is, and decrease to zero. Now you note with all of these cases, I've started at a free end, I've started somewhere where I had a pretty good understanding of what the shear force and bending moments are going to be. They're going to be zero at any free tip because there's nothing there that's going to generate forces or moments. Now, the bending moment diagram for this case is a little bit trickier. Um, Uh, it's going to do something like zero up to a maxima, and then no, I haven't done my I haven't done my slopes very well here, but it's going to it's going to keep increasing. I think. Let me just. If I drawn my shear force diagram better, I would have had a better a better opportunity to do this. Let me just do that. Okay. Now, the points at which the um, bending moment diagram is going to go to zero are ones where we have a summation on the left and the summation on the right that are the same. So assuming that this area here and this area here are the same, then the bending moment is going to come back to zero there. Then it's going to increase again and then go back to zero there. Now, that one... There could be mistakes in that. I, I'm not. Um, the magnitudes and the, and the um, positions matter a little bit for that one. But you can see, in principle, we can very quickly draw some shear force and bending moment diagrams um, for any configuration, and we should know what to expect. Now, I'll just erase the ink and show you why we would do this. These are just 
simplified cases of what might we might be wanting to analyze for. So the weight of engines hanging off a wing, the distributed lift on a wing, and generating lift while it's still sitting on the ground. That's a bit of an awkward situation. But, um, or the wings, the, the distributed loads on a fuselage. So the wings essentially pick the fuselage up. Um, so you can think of the wings as, as simple supports for the fuselage. Okay, so those three diagrams we just drew give us, if we treat the fuselage and the wings like beams, they give us an indication of how we might want to generate um, shear force and bending moment diagrams for those beams. And with those shear force and bending moment diagrams, then we can calculate stresses. Uh, as long as we can translate between shear force and stress and between bending moment stress, uh, which is what the, in a few lectures time we will start to do. Okay, so the, the primary loads, now what I want to talk about major loads, the things that are generally likely to cause us problems and the things that we have to analyze for, for most aircraft, the wings are the critical piece of structure and they, they take in the most material. So the critical load case for wings is bending. Okay, so they're generally very slender, and they have to be slender for aerodynamic reasons. Uh, and so the aerodynamicists tell us this is the shape of your wing, and the structures people say, that's really painful. Don't give us such a thin wing. Um, and the aerodynamicists say, too bad. Make a thin wing. And so your job as a structural engineer is to, is to make, get enough material in there to make it withstand the loads. But if you think about this really long, slender set of wings or flappy arms, the lift is being generated at a distance from the fuselage. That means that it's generating a bending moment. So if we go back to our bending moment diagram, this one um, in the middle here, there was quite a large moment at the wing root. So at the root, the inboard part of the wing, there was quite a large moment. That is the primary load that we have to worry about on wings when we're analyzing them. Um, also torsion. So as we talked about, when we talked about the aerodynamic center, the airflow generates a moment. And as you go along, the wing is, because it's slender, is also got a fairly low torsional rigidity. And so that torsion being generated by the airflow is actually another critical case as well. For the fuselage, bending and torsion are a matter, but also internal pressure. So for pressurized fuselages, the fact that we pump it up and are trying to burst it uh, is, is another critical thing to consider. Now, if we, this is a, a sort of abstract question, it may not be easy for you to answer, but if we want to minimize bending loads, where do we want to put our weight? So if we had, a, if we had an aircraft and the aim was to, to minimize bending moments, or even a beam, if we just think about a beam, if we wanted to minimize bending moments, okay, let me just draw a little picture. Let's have a wing here. It's got an engine hanging off it. Okay, and it's got some lift distribution. and a point load for where the engine is. Now, if we wanted to add, say we had some discretion about where our fuel was going to go, where do we want to put the weight to keep the bending moment as low as possible? Further out, the wing? Yeah, so we, we're really trying to put our weights where the lift is being generated, so to balance it out like immediately. So the further out we can get the weight, the lower we can keep the moments. So if we think about, this in its current configuration is going to be quite a sizable bending moment near the root. But if we put a bunch of distributed um, weight in for the fuel, then we can offset a large amount of that bending moment. And this is what we call wing relief. And we'll talk about this um, 
a little bit more in this lecture. But anything we can do where we can get weight out where it's being, where the lift is being generated, the moments come down. The big problem with aircraft is that the lift is being generated at a distance from where the weight is, and that generates large moments. And that, so getting rid of those is really important. Now, here's a question that you would have come across in, um, well, the first question at least in second year mechanics. Um, what's the best beam configuration for carrying bending moments? I beam, yes. Everyone's heard of an I beam. I may have just given away the answer to the second one. What about torsion? What about a, a beam that's being loaded in torque, which we probably should call a shaft? What do we want to do with a, a shaft? Circular? What, is there anything particular about a hollow circle, circle or a solid circle? Hollow, yeah. So we want a thin-walled, hollow tube which I'm not used to actually drawing wall thicknesses. As we'll see through this course, there's no real reason to draw wall thicknesses for most of what we do. Um, when we think about beams and, and shafts, we're, we're going to try to abstract our aircraft into these kind of classic engineering uh, cases. We want to think about our aircraft as beams and shafts as much as possible because then it gives us the tools that we need to do the analysis. So if we wanted something to carry bending, we want an I-beam. If we want something to carry torque or torsion, we want a tube. Let's do a bit of a back of the envelope calculation. So this analysis takes the same amount of material. So there's, there's a, a box that I'm putting that material inside, which is dashed. And then I have considered a flat plate, an I-beam, and a square box. And the amount of material is constant. So this thickness here, T plate, is, um, and if we call this T box, T plate equals 4 times T box. Okay, so I've distributed the, the same amount of area to these sections. So this one's a bit thicker, the, the plate's a bit thicker, and the, the uh, box is a bit thinner. But So they weigh the same, essentially. The bending stiffness of the, if we normalize the bending stiffness, and we can do that through IXX, IXX is a measure of our bending stiffness, then the I-beam is 1,500 times stiffer in bending than the plate. Um, but the box is also... 1,300 times stiffer, so it's still pretty good. If we look at the torsional stiffness, which we can do with our polar moment of inertia, the polar moment of inertia for the, or oh, sorry, polar moment of area, for the um, I-beam is actually less. It's an eighth of the flat plate. So the I-beam has got a lower torsional rigidity than the flat plate does. But the box has got 500 times the torsional rigidity of the flat plate. Okay? So... What we can see, if we've got structures that are loaded in both bending and torsion, which wings and fuselages are, we want hollow, thin-walled sections. We want stuff that's got a lot of space in the middle, lots of material out near the edge, and that gives us the best case for carrying bending and torque. And if you look inside most aircraft, that's exactly what you've got. You've got a lot of material in the skin that's carrying loads and not much um, in the middle. So a classic aircraft, the one that would give us the most efficient possible structure, uh, really, I mean, it's a coat can, really. Um, something that's a thin-walled structure with, with maximum distribution of material to the outside. It's the best balance of torque and bending and direct load carrying that we can have. And the engineering that goes into a Coke can is, is pretty insane. But the, we can't use those kinds of structures in many applications. Even this rocket, which looks like it would be a perfect application for a thin-walled 
um, structure has got lots of internal reinforcement. And we'll talk about why that is in just a second. But has anyone seen that thing that people do as kids and where you can stand on a Coke can and you can pretty much take your entire weight, except as soon as you put the slightest little defect in it, it, it collapses to nothing? If you've got, a, if you've got a, a pure Coke can, it'll easily carry 100 kilos empty and probably like 300 kilos full. Um, but as soon as you put a little defect in the wall, that drops to next to nothing. Um, so these closed box sections or tube sections have very high bending stiffness, um, very high torsional stiffness, and they're very efficient. Um, and they're also very good at carrying pressure loads. So aerodynamic pressure load, because the skin on the outside is the same thing. It's carrying the lot pressure loads, and it's also carrying the structural load. Um, so this concept of putting the skin of the material being the, the load-bearing part of the structure is what we call stress skin design. So we don't have a frame and then a parasitic facade on the outside. The skin of the aircraft is actually carrying the load. Um, so that, that's what we call a stress skin design. Now, just as a little um, point of uh, interest, a Coke can, if you scale a Coke can up to the size of a 747, so you just took this, the aluminium can and made it as big as a 747, which 747 is really an aluminium can as well, um, the wall thickness of the Coke can is thicker than the 747. Um, so you think about the relative wall thickness of an aluminium can to its di diameter. A 747 and other aluminium aircraft have thinner walls than, than that relative to their diameter. They're very, very thin. There's probably only, for most of the fuselage, there's only about four millimeters of alum aluminium between you and the outside wall. Um, there's not much there at all. Yep. Question? There's, there's other reinforcement which we'll talk about. But in terms of carrying pressure loads and like if you really wanted to get something and stab a hole through it, then there's not much material there. Um, so this, this sort of logically takes us to the point, well, why don't we have aircraft that are just big cans? Why do we have this internal structure that you will see inside some aircraft? Well. The driving force to make them like aluminium cans is that the thickness needs to be minimized. It's a big contributor to structural weight. But as it thins out, it gets more and more prone to buckling. And buckling is something we won't talk about until late in the semester, but it's an instability. So if you take a bit of paper in your exercise book or a plastic ruler or something that's fairly thin, in tension, it's actually surprisingly strong. Like a piece of paper is, is really quite strong in tension, and it's really quite strong in, in shear. But a second that you apply any compression to it, it's, it doesn't fail. The material doesn't break, but it's, it's got no stability. So if you, if you take your exercise book and just collapse it like that, it'll, it'll just buckle. It's not, the material's not breaking, but it's just got no ability to withstand any load. And this is exactly the same as what happens with, with aircraft structures. As we make them thinner and bigger, they become very, very susceptible to, to buckling and also other failure modes through buckling, which we call crippling. Um, so what we end up doing is putting an internal structure in to support against buckling, and we find the optimal combination of skin and, and frame. And this is what we end up with is something we call a stressed skin construction. And this is not how aircraft are always made, and it's still, there's still a lot of aircraft that don't use this design paradigm, but most of them do, most, of, most big aircraft do. Um, so the, like the, the definition of this term is that any construction that relies wholly or in part on the skin to carry the main loads um, and provide stiffness and additional strength. That's what we call a stress skin design. So this is a, a cutaway of part of a fuselage. You'll have um, longerons, skin, and frames. And don't worry about these names. We'll talk about them in a bit um, about what they all mean. But the combination of area, there's roughly as much area in all of these longitudinal stiffening members as there is in the skin. 
So it's about a 50-50 mix of material in the subframe and in the skin, and they're both sharing the loads. And it's that combination that ends up with, a, with the best configuration for us. So historically, aircraft weren't always built that way. And, and even to this day, there are still quite a few frame type structures inside light aircraft. Um, the original aircraft came from bicycle manufacturers. So the Wright brothers were bicycle repair people. Um, they thought in the, like bicycle people, they built bicycle frames and they put skin around them and made an aircraft. Um, so they had these space frame kind of configurations. And the load in these space frames is carried as direct forces. Okay, so it's either tension or compression in a, in a member. And the skin on the outside was just parasitic. All it was doing was either providing a surface so that it minimized drag or providing a, a, a surface to take the aerodynamic pressure and put it into the, into the frame. And as a result, all of the weight of the skin is just subtracting from the performance of the aircraft. On the plus side, is that it's easier to make more damage tolerant structures like this. You can make a redundant truss that if you, if you poke holes in your skin, you're not really degrading the performance of the, of the airframe very much. Now, the characteristics of these type of aircraft is that they're generally welded or bracketed trusses. Um, they'll have regular box shapes. So if you look along, along here, um, my pen has, has gone AWOL. Um, no, it hasn't. There, there are there are regular box structures. You'll see these repeating boxes, um, and then they'll have shear ties. So here you can see them as well. There are box structures here, and then they'll have shear ties in them to to withstand the. Um, shear loads. And the longer ons take bending into the fuselage. So if you see here, there are these longitudinal members that are taking most of the bending moments in the airframe. And here, longitudinal members taking the bending moments. Um, and the skins are, are parasitic and they're only carrying local loads. Now, the exact opposite end of the spectrum are monocoque structures. And monocoque is a, a pretend French word. Um, I don't remember who coined it, but they thought they were, being, they were making up a French sounding word. Um, but it essentially means single shell. So uh, balloons, for instance, are monocoque structures, because all, all of the load is being carried in the shell. A Coke can is a monocoque structure. Um, some space components, rocket components, are monocoque structures. Um, but they're characterized by large cylindrical, elliptical, or spherical structures, with very thin skins, um, and very little internal support. And normally, they're internally pressurized. So most of the strength of a Coke can in transport comes from the fact that it's internally pressurized. They're extremely efficient. Um, but the, any cutout, any hole in the can or any change in geometry needs to be heavily reinforced. So if you look at the top of the can, for instance, where the, where the opening is, um, there's a lot of extra material and extra reinforcement where that opening is um, in order to carry the loads. And at the base where the geometry changes again, it's much, much heavier. The walls of the can are significantly lighter than the top and the bottom put together. Um, and so anywhere we need an opening, and unfortunately aircraft need a lot of openings, you have to have lots and lots of reinforcement. So it degrades the, the benefits of having thin, thin uh, monocoque structures. And buckling is a big issue. Any defect and you lose strength massively. So the, the compromise and the, what you'll see in next, nearly every aircraft out there at the moment that's of a reasonable size, light aircraft maybe not, um, are semi-monocoque structures. And semi-monocoque is just semi-single shell, um, where we have a subframe and a skin 
and they're both carrying loads together. And they're give or take for a structural component like a wing, about half the weight will be in the subframe and about half the weight will be in the skin. Okay, so a bit more in the subframe because there's other things that it's doing. But um, if you look up any aircraft cutaway, um, and you can find these, there's sort of flight, flight international, flight global. Um, you can just Google aircraft cutaways. Um, you'll see the same setup. You'll see subframe with a skin on top. Okay, and so these are some examples. This is the inside of what a 787 looks like. Um, this is the inside of a 747. And uh, I don't know what that one is. I think that's a picture I took it. Um, oh, no, I didn't take that picture. I have no idea what, the, what that aircraft is. Um, but you can see, if you look closely here, there's longitudinal <coughs> stiffening members running the length of the aircraft, frames running um, around the diameter. Again here, longitudinal stiffening and frames and a skin. And all of those are acting together to carry the flight loads. They give us the best balance of structural efficiency and robustness and the best overall performance for a given weight. Um, but the, the negative is it's not quite the most efficient structure. It's not quite the most damage tolerant structure. It's, but it's the best combination. All right, another little activity, because I know for most of you, unless you've been um, a plane nerd your entire life, and I wasn't when I came into aerospace engineering, um, you may not have, you may not be familiar with some of the terminology. Um, so if you've got the notebook, copy this out of the notebook. Otherwise, just take down these um, 16 um, labels. Now. There's going to be some ridiculous ones in there, like door. Um, but I needed 16 to make a nice grid. Um, <coughs> so take down the labels. And I'm, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to show a picture of the aircraft. Um, and then you can start sticking the labels on the aircraft. Here's your picture of the aircraft. Put an A, B, C, D, whatever next to all of those things that you've taken down. Um, so hopefully, I don't, ex I don't expect you to know all of these, but hopefully you know by now that the pointy end at the front we call the nose, and the bit at the back we call the tail. Um, and we have a couple of wings here, and a couple of engines hanging off those wings, so I haven't really bothered too much with, with those kind of labels. Um, we have landing gear underneath, which we can have some labels for in a minute. Um, but then it gets a little bit more nuanced about what everything else is called. So let's go through um, A. Anyone want to volunteer their answer? Nose landing, nose landing gear, yes. It's the landing gear that's in the nose, um, which is good. B. Nose. This one's easy. Nose, yes. The pointy bit at the front. Um, C. Cockpit. Cockpit, yes. It's where the people who break our aircraft sit. Um, D? Aileron. Yes. Um, so, ailerons control what? The roll of the aircraft. Yes. So, we'll talk a bit about coordinates in a minute, but um, we have different attitudes and different control of those attitudes in the aircraft. Generally, we have, we, we treat the aircraft as an orthogonal system where we have a vector that's pointing forward, a vector that's pointing out one wing, and a vector that's pointing down. Um, and we say fore aft is, is going sort of forwards to backwards. Um, and then we have inboard and outboard is going um, sideways. And I can't remember the vertical up and down because we don't use it very often. Um, but, but 
changes in attitude relative to those coordinates. If we roll about, ro we roll about the longitudinal axis, okay, we pitch about the transverse axis, and we yaw about the vertical axis. So ailerons control roll. Now, E, wing, it's nice and easy. F, okay, we've got a couple of, so it's a horizontal stabilizer. We'll get to elevator in a minute. Um, horizontal tail, horizontal stabilizer, they're both the same, same meaning. Um, they provide stability, which is in the name, stabilizer. They stabilize the pitch of the aircraft. Okay, so if you, if you tried to deviate from the, the pitch that you have, they would restore and stabilize. They don't control pitch, but they, they stabilize pitch. Um, G. Vertical stabilizer, and the vertical stabilizer controls your, um, or stabilizes your H rudder. Now, the rudder controls your. Now, as you'll find out in, in the courses as you go along, it's not that simplistic. Once you put the rudder on or any of the controls, you get extra reactions. So if you put the ailerons down, you don't just roll. You also yaw at the same time because you generate drag. So there's, there's complex interactions here, but for the first pass, the rudder controls the oar. I, elevator, it controls pitch, sort of. It's actually, not, it doesn't really control pitch. It primarily controls your airspeed, but that's not my course's job to teach you about that. Um, J, empennage. Yes, it's one that sort of people get to the end and go, what the hell is that? It's the only one left. Um, the empennage is pretty much, it's a, another French sounding word for anything rear of the rear pressure bulkhead. So lots of aircraft have these tapering tails. So anything in what we would call the tail structure, we call the empennage. K. Flaps. Flaps, yeah. So high lift devices generally live inboard. So ailerons live outboard generally so that you can control the aircraft, you need a lot of moment so that you can actually provide that control. Flaps and high lift devices generally live inboard because then it generates less moment on the wings. This is depending on the aircraft. Um, some aircraft have what are called flaperons, which are actually flaps and ailerons together. So you can have the surfaces do both. Generally, flaps are deployed downwards together to generate more lift. But if they also have independent control, they can be deployed downwards and differentially applied, which gives us the ability to control roll. So if they're both just down together, they're generating just lift. If you can then differentially control them, you can roll them as well. Um, most high-speed aircraft, so things traveling close to sort of Mach 0 0.8, 0 0.9, which is most of our airliners, will have outboard ailerons out here, and they'll also have flaperons in inboard. So you at high speed you lock these out so they can't move and all of your roll control is done with the inboard ones because just like if you're flying down the freeway at, at um, 150 kilometers an hour and you very quickly turn your steering wheel it wouldn't be a very easy vehicle to control. You need precise control at speed and you don't which is why they have inboard um, ailerons and they'll have at low speeds, they'll have outboard ailerons. Um, where are we up to? L. Wing tip, yes. So we talk about the wing tip and the wing root. So the root is where it attaches to the fuselage, and the tip's where it points out into space. Uh, M, leading edge. So leading edge is at the front, trailing edge is at the back. N, main landing gear. O, Fuselage and P, we finish on a high note. Door, yes. Cabin door. Um, of which there are generally a few. All right, now this diagram I'll leave you to review because there's a lot of text on it. Um, and I've, this is a NASA diagram, but I disagree with NASA.
completely on some of these, so I've crossed them out. Um, so, because they're just flat out wrong. Um, the, the horizontal stabilizer, as it says in the name, stabilizes pitch, and the vertical and the rudder controls your. So they've just they've just used the wrong verbs. Um, but other than that, they're they're pretty good. Um, but I'll leave you to the review that by yourself. Once you take the skin off, you can get these cutaway diagrams. This is something that you can, um, by the end of your aero degree here, your aero design groups will be generating something like this. This is actually a CATIA drawing from my aerospace design project in fourth year. Um, I didn't build this, someone else in the team did. But we need to get to the point from now until two years from here where you're skilled enough as engineers to be generating um, these kind of layout diagrams for an aircraft and knowing not necessarily the details of the, the size and shape of every component, but how to lay it out and why it's laid out in that configuration. A um, bit of terminology, we're really quickly running out of time, but inside a wing we have our skins on the outside, we have control surfaces on the back, um, ailerons, Stringers are the longitudinal stiffening members. We have spars are these vertical members inside that are carrying bending moments. Um, we have a rear spar and a front spar. Generally, we'll have two. Sometimes we'll have more. Um, and we have spar webs, which are the vertical parts here, and spar caps, which are the tops and bottoms. Um, primarily, all the skin at the top and bottom and these stiffening members is what's carrying the bending moments. And this closed box we have here, we call the wing box, that's what's providing the torsional stability. So the skins and the spar webs together create our wing box. And in a fuselage, we have skin and longitudinal stiffening members are called longerons and frames that are going the other way. And what I didn't mention here is this transverse bit of structure which goes fore aft is called a rib. So a rib is carrying the, it's keeping the wing, wing shaped primarily because there's pressures that are pulling out and it's keeping the wing wing shaped and it's also providing attachment load points for control surfaces and landing gear and engines and other things. 